history has transformed the field of linguistics the way Dr. Chomsky has. A few decades ago, Dr. Chomsky's work in universal grammar ended a raging debate among linguists and psychologists over Chomsky versus Skinner. Dr. Chomsky's work proposes the existence of a language acquisition device, a black box that is universal to all humans. Dr. Chomsky's work in, in universal grammar and transformation grammar revolutionized the field of linguistics and opened the floodgate for new thoughts on language and cognition. But in spite of all the progress made in the last few decades, there are many questions remain unanswered or unknown to us. This morning, we have the pleasure to have Americans' number one linguist to speak to us on questions such as how do we acquire the knowledge of language? What it means when we are able to speak and understand a language? How do we use this knowledge? What are the physical mechanisms involved in the representation, acquisition, and use of this knowledge? And what is there in this little black box? Dr. Chomsky is Institute Professor of MIT and Professor of Linguistics. He has been honored with many, many degrees and awards. He's a member of many professional and learned societies in the United States and abroad. Among them, he is a fellow of the American Academy, Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Science. He is also a recipient of the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award of the American Psychological Association. Dr. Chomsky has written many, many books and articles and has spoken all over the world. Before we start, I would like to thank Winona State University, WSU Lyceum Series, and the Student Activity Committee for sponsoring this event. I would also like to thank the Minnesota Humanities Commission for its support. Thanks to Bakery and all who have worked so hard to make this dream a reality. And thank you, Dr. Chomsky, for coming all the way from Boston. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome American's number one linguist, Dr. Noam Chomsky. This thing looks kind of like a presidential press conference or something like that. Hope you're not intimidated. Uh, the uh, contemporary study of language, which was just described, uh, is uh, from some points of view uh, a very ancient study. In fact, this, that its uh, roots lie in uh, classical India and Greece 2,500 years ago. It's maybe the first branch of uh, oops, first branch of systematic uh, human inquiry, maybe along with astronomy. Uh, and uh, had many great achievements along the way. Uh, from another point of view, it's a rather young field. The major research enterprises that preoccupy people today were formulated in something like their contemporary form about 40 years ago, when uh, lots of uh, traditional ideas and insights and uh, concerns were rediscovered. Uh, rediscovered, incidentally, in total ignorance of the tradition which had been completely forgotten uh, and, if even mentioned, was mostly derided or uh, uh, dismissed with contempt. I remember that very well from my own student days at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard. Uh, the, uh, uh, and in fact, it is now that the tradition is slowly being rediscovered and still largely unknown, uh, it's turning out to be remarkably pertinent to contemporary concerns. So just to illustrate the MIT Press, just which is, uh, publishes most of the, a lot of the technical work on linguistics and uh, 
related fields, uh, cognitive psychology and so on, has just published a book by a computational linguist on uh, the structure of the lexicon, which derives quite self-consciously from uh, Aristotelian roots. And in fact, modern universal grammar, or generative grammar, or whatever it's called, is uh, 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 actually has close resemblance to the uh, uh, work that was done 2,500 years ago in uh, Indian grammar, which turns out to have been remarkably sophisticated. Uh, there is a completely new cast to a lot of these traditional questions, but uh, there's also continuity, which it's well to bear in mind. Uh, the, uh, modern, uh, the modern field, last 40 years or so, uh, developed uh, within the framework of what is sometimes called the cognitive revolution of the 1950s. Actually, it would be more proper, I think, to call it the second cognitive revolution. Uh, because in many ways it recapitulated and rediscovered uh, insights and understanding that had been developed during what ought to be called the first cognitive revolution uh, of the 17th century, which was part of the general scientific revolution from uh, you know, the Galilean revolution that radically transformed the way we think about the world. And one part of that was uh, uh, the, a kind of a cognitive revolution associated mostly with Descartes. We, read Descartes these days as a philosopher, but the distinction between philosophy and science didn't even exist until the mid-19th century. Philosophers were just scientists or, you know, historians or something like that. Uh, and uh, Descartes was, essentially, was a major contributor to the scientific revolution of the 17th century, and part of it was uh, what we nowadays call as philosophy. Uh, the science, of course, has been superseded, you know, 300 years ago. Uh, but uh, so. It's not called science anymore, but a lot of it hasn't been superseded and, in fact, is being rediscovered. Uh, throughout the whole period of the study of language, long period, it's been intimately connected with the study of higher mental faculties, uh, which is natural. Some language is sometimes ca called a mirror of mind. It's distinctly human possession, which seems to be closely connected with other aspects of uh, human cognition, the higher mental faculties in general, uh, what's sometimes called mind. And that was true during the first cognitive revolution as well, the Cartesian revolution. Uh, I think it's important to understand what that was all about. Uh, we, in many ways, the contemporary period, in my view, is a regression from that time. Uh, and uh, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, made progress, but uh, what, what the issues, I think, are not well understood and are leading to quite a lot of confusion in contemporary work in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, what's called cognitive science, and so on. So let's think for a moment about what actually happened. Uh, the modern scientific revolution, starting with Galileo, essentially, uh, was aimed to construct a picture of the world that was uh, mechanical, an idea that the world was a machine big complicated machine made out of things like levers and gears and so on, which essentially could be constructed could be constructed in principle by a master artisan. Of course, nobody's smart enough to do it, but uh, it had that character. It's the kind of thing you could construct, like a huge clock or something like that. Uh, and in fact, it was assumed it was constructed by a super artisan, you know, uh, better than any human artisan but it was a mechanical device. That was called the mechanical philosophy. But remember, philosophy just meant science, so it was essentially the science of mechanics. Uh, Descartes was a major figure in uh, uh, advancing and developing the mechanical philosophy, the conception of the world as a machine. Uh, the idea was, from roughly Galileo on, to overcome the mystical character of uh, neoscholastic science, uh, the reigning physics of the day, uh, which held that the world was operated in terms of mystical forces. Uh, so if, uh, um, say, a, a flower grows from a seed, that's because it has a vegetative force. And if something falls to the ground, it's because that's its natural place and where it wants to be. Uh, and uh, uh, if two things attract one and each other, it's because they have a s sympathy. And if they repel one another, they have an antipathy. And uh, if I see a cube, let's say, uh, rotating in space, it's because the physical cube, the form of the cube rotating in space, flits through the air in some fashion and gets into my brain. 
and in my brain there's a cube rotating in space, so that's what I see. Uh, that these are the idea, the kinds of conceptions of the physics of the day, the physics and physiology of the day. And the goal of the mechanical philosophy was to try to get rid of all that stuff and account for everything in terms of strictly mechanical principles that could be understood, uh, principles of the principles that we see when we see a machine, parts of a machine working, and try to show that the whole world works like that. Well, Descartes made, as I say, made a lot of progress in this. Uh, he uh, extended the mechanical philosophy to, uh, he thought he extended it to the biological world, uh, to a good part of uh, human nature. Uh, so, for example, probably his most lasting scientific contributions, the ones that can really be restated in somewhat different forms today, had to do with his theory of vision. So he and other scientists of the day mocked the idea that the form of an object flits through the air and gets into your mind. They said it's pure mysticism. Uh, it's got to be a mechanical interchange of some kind. And he had a theory of light, uh, which was mechanical and recognized that the retinal image, what's on your retina, uh, is not the cube rotating in space. Or let's say if I look at the audience, uh, my, I see people sitting around and so on, but that's not the retinal image. The retinal image is some complicated two-dimensional display which could be interpreted in all sorts of ways. Uh, Descartes recognized that what you see must be a construction of the mind. It has to come from the inside uh, in the terms that were used by later mm -hmm. philosophers working on this. Uh, the, uh, sense, the sensory organs just provide the occasion or experience, which hits the sensory organs, provides the occasion uh, for the mind to construct experience using its own internal resources, its own cognoscative powers in the terms of the day, which were understood to be innate. They had to be innate cogno cognoscative, hard to say it, powers. Uh, properties of the mind uh, which somehow use the occasion of sense to create what you see, a cube rotating in space, people walking down the street, uh, you know, people sitting in front of me, whatever it may be. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, it was also understood, as I say, that this was innate. So for example, Descartes was struck by the fact, he, he didn't do the experiments, but if he did the experiments, they would come out the way he imagined. Uh, even Galileo didn't do most of the famous experiments. He mostly imagined them. They're thought experiments. Some, some of them are physically impossible, in fact. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Descartes did a thought experiment, which is undoubtedly correct. He asked, uh, how, how is it that if you have an infant uh, with, who's never seen a triangle, let's say, and you draw, a suppose I were to draw a triangle on the blackboard, and the infant were to look at it, uh, what the infant would perceive uh, is a triangle. But in fact, what I drew is certainly not a triangle. I mean, it's some physical thing which couldn't possibly be a triangle. I mean, maybe two of the lines wouldn't quite come together or one of them would be curved or whatever. Uh, so why is it that the infant perceives a triangle, maybe a distorted triangle, and not a perfect uh, image of exactly what it is? Why is that the case? And if you do experiments now, you find that is the case. Well, his uh, conclusion was uh, that it must be that the innate structure of the mind is based on principles like those of Euclidean geometry. And on the occasion of sense, the mind simply constructs a triangle, uh, and whatever the sensory object is, is seen as some distortion of what the mind constructs. Uh, all of this is, a, and, and then he had theories of how the sensory image gets into the mind which constructs those things and so on. Mechanical theories, uh, which we wouldn't put in quite those terms today, but can be restated in, in modern terms without you know, very dramatic change apart from the mechanisms. Uh, a lot of the, all of this is quite plausible and in fact apparently true uh, in a modern re reformulation and modern neurophysiology and you know, perceptual psychology is giving sharper accounts which are roughly of that kind. Uh, Descartes pursued this as far as he could. He wanted to see how far you could go in giving a hypothetical account of uh, the way the world could be a machine, up to things like human sensation and perception. And he concluded that you could go quite a long way, but that some things were left out. Uh, 
what was left out primarily was uh, acts of human will, uh, which he said are uh, our uh, most noblest possession, the only thing that's truly human. Uh, so he, there was a lot of interest in those days in automata, just as there is today. Uh, the automata in that, at that time were complicated devices, you know, that uh, were made by master artisans and did all sorts of amazing things. And the question naturally arose, what's the difference between a human and an automaton, if there is any? Uh, and Descartes argued that this is precisely where the difference would lie. In fact, for him, it was the difference between humans and automata, and also between humans and animals, which were automata. Uh, the uh, difference lay in acts of will. So in the case of a machine, an automaton, uh, if you set its parts in a certain arrangement uh, and you had some external input, uh, the machine is compelled to act in a certain fashion, has no choice about the matter. It could be random. It's, but it's either going to be random or determined. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a human being and you, its parts are internal, parts are arranged in a certain way and it has a certain ex sensory experience, it may be, as they put it, incited and inclined to act in a certain matter, manner, but, uh, it might, uh, but it's not compelled to do so. It could act in a different manner. So if somebody were to walk up here with you know, an assault rifle or something and uh, order everyone to stand up and say, uh, you know, Heil Hitler or something. And if you took him seriously, it's, you know, it's very probable that everybody would do it. You'd be incited and inclined to do it. Uh, but we all know that there is a choice. Uh, you might decide to get killed, let's say, because you don't want to do it. Uh, and those things are not determined. Uh, there's no mechanistic determination of that. Uh, if we know, any, we know that as well as we know anything at all. Uh, and that is kind of irreducible, phenomenal knowledge, experience. Uh, and Descartes argued that that's the crucial difference between humans and uh, animals. Incidentally, we have no reason to doubt that at the moment. Uh, but uh, uh, anyhow, that's uh, the Cartesian argument. Uh, the most striking example that he offered was, in fact, language use. Uh, he pointed out that uh, ordinary use of language, I don't mean writing poetry or anything, just you know, talking to your friends at a bus stop or whatever, uh, ordinary use of language has a kind of creative aspect. Uh, it's uh, unbounded. People are always saying new things that were never heard before in their experience or maybe in human history. Uh, they don't know that they're new. There's no way of knowing whether a sentence that you just heard is one you've heard before. It's impossible. Uh, so human, ordinary human interchange with language is constantly innovative and productive and unbounded. In fact, it's infinite in a technical sense. Uh, on the other hand, and it's also undetermined. So you can't determine what a person's going to say on the basis of the ex situation that they're in or the uh, arrangement of their internal organs. On the other hand, it's not random. So it's not caused by situations or internal states, but it's somehow appropriate to situations. Uh, it's coherent. Uh, other people understand it. It evokes thoughts in other people, which they could have expressed that way themselves if they had had the thought. And maybe they do have the thought after they hear the expression. So these, this collection of properties of being unbounded, uh, undetermined, uncaused but appropriate to situations, coherent, evoking thoughts in others and so on. That's a kind of creative aspect of language use. Uh, and uh, Descartes argued that that's the striking difference between humans and automata. There was a lot of interest in those days in trying to train, uh, in asking whether you could construct an automaton or train an animal or whatever uh, to act uh, the way a human does, and they most mostly the of the experiments turned on they were they weren't again weren't actually carried out, but most experiments in that period, even physics, weren't carried out. They were thought about. Uh, the uh, experiments turned on this, you know. So people would list the kinds of experimental te uh, techniques you might try to see if another organ, another object that looks like you, uh, has a mind like yours, and they were mostly language tests based on the creative aspect of language. Well, uh, in order to deal with these uh, apparent facts, and we have no reason to doubt that they're facts, in fact, they seem to be facts, in order to deal with that, uh, Descartes had a problem. You couldn't incorporate this within the mechanical philosophy, so it wasn't a matter of gears and levers and so on. 
Uh, so he uh, was forced to invent a new principle, which is standard science, incidentally. Something isn't explained by the principles you have, you construct a new principle. Uh, the new principle is what he called the mind. So alongside of body, which works by mechanical principles, there's another principle, a kind of creative principle, uh, has other properties too, uh, which is mind. That's the famous Cartesian dualism. Uh, uh, so there's the world consists of body and special human characteristic mind, which distinguishes humans from uh, uh, animals and automata and turns on factors like these. Uh, and others, but primarily these. Uh, the, uh, what was the fate of this doctrine? Here's where misunderstanding enters. Uh, the fate of this doctrine was, uh, uh, sh should be clearly understood. It was overthrown within a generation by Isaac Newton. Uh, but what Newton showed was that the theory of body was wrong. He didn't have anything to say about the theory of mind. That stayed unchanged. Uh, Newton showed that the world just isn't a machine. Uh, it works by mystical forces. Uh, that was an appalling discovery. It, uh, Newton considered it a total absurdity uh, and to the end of his life tried to overcome it, but it was apparently true. Uh, namely, the force of attraction is, has no, and does not involve contact. So I can, you know, unbelievable as it is, move the moon by lifting my arm. Uh, and that's just the way the world works. It has mystical forces. Uh, as I say, Newton was regarded this as a total absurdity. He was sharply condemned by the scientists of the day, the leading scientists of the day, for returning to neo-scholastic mysticism uh, with uh, occult forces, as they were called, that uh, uh, made the world work uh, so the, and showed that the world couldn't possibly be a machine. And these were unintelligible forces. We couldn't understand them. They were mysterious. I mean, common sense tells us that I can only make something move by touching it, by being in contact with it in some fashion. But Newtonian physics said, no, that's not true. There's an occult force that uh, allows you to make things move and that accounts for the terrestrial motion and planetary motion and the tides and so on and so forth. Well, as I say, this was considered a total absurdity, but it was apparently true. Uh, and what it does is demolish the conception of body. It demolishes the idea that uh, the world is a machine. It isn't. It has mystical forces. Uh, it's common these days to say, to ridicule the Cartesian idea of the ghost in the machine. The mind's a ghost inside the machine, but that's misunderstanding. Uh, what was exorcised was the machine, not the ghost. You know, the ghost stayed where it was. Uh, it turned out the world was not a machine. There are no machines uh, in the sense of our common sense understanding uh, and uh, uh, the mechanical philosophy, the physics of the day. So that goal was undermined. It turns out the world is indeed unintelligible to us. We have to accept the existence of mystical forces. We can try to construct, develop an understanding of their principles, and doctrines about them, and so on. But they're not intelligible to human understanding. And the mind stays where it was. Uh, this, these ideas were more, I mean, this was, a, like I, as I say, a kind of an outrageous discovery. Newton tried to overcome it to the end of his days. Uh, into the tw well into the 20th century, physicists were still trying to construct some kind of mechanical conception of the universe. By now, that's finally been abandoned totally, and uh, people are accustomed to even more mystical notions like you know, fields, which are mathematical objects, but still interact with one another, uh, electromagnetic forces, uh, you know, uh, a conception of space and time which eliminates any notion of solidity or, uh, you know, uh, in fact, every, all of common sense is just gone. It's not even a, it's not even a, it's not even considered relevant at this point. Uh, yes, the world is unintelligible to our common sense, but that's just the way it is. Uh, we do the best we can in trying to construct doctrines about it. Uh, what we're left with, and this was reasonably well understood in the 18th century, uh, is just that we can consider various aspects of the world. So we can consider its mechanical aspects and its electrical aspects and uh, optical aspects and chemical aspects and mental aspects and so on. And we can try to study them uh, and develop bodies of doctrine about them. And then we can try to unify these bodies of doctrine uh, as best we can. But we, of course, we're 
hoping to find a kind of a unified interpretation of the world, uh, not expecting to understand any of it, uh, just, you know, it's sort of, we understand it in some level, but not in the sense that was hoped for by Galileo and other scientists of the scientific revolution. Uh, and that's the best you can do. Uh, as far as thought is concerned, by the, by the end of the 18th century, there were a fair number of people, well-known scientists like Joseph Priestley and others, who recognized that we just have to assume that uh, uh, just as matter has properties that we cannot comprehend, like attraction and repulsion, uh, or you know electrical properties and so on, well, it just we also have to accept that certain arrangements of the parts of the brain uh, produce thought. Uh, it's a property of the organic structure of the brain. Uh, and uh, that was actually proposed by John Locke, but developed through the 18th century. And in fact, uh, there is no alternative. There's no other way of thinking about it. It's kind of a, um, these days you find, you know, best-selling books and articles and so on about, you know, the astonishing hypothesis or the radical new idea that uh, thought or consciousness or whatever are just... Uh, products of the structure of the brain. Yeah, it's just what they understood in the 18th century uh, because there's no alternative. You know, since the concept of body and matter has disappeared, uh, all that we can say is, well, whatever is in there is uh, producing thought. Uh, one image used in the 18th century, late 18th century, was that uh, the brain secretes thought the way the liver secretes bile. Uh, neither was understood, but uh, that's just what happens. You try to understand them as best you can. Uh, and you try to work towards unification. And that's not a trivial matter. So if you take the science that's closest to physics, namely chemistry, uh, unification with physics was finally achieved, but uh, very recently. In fact, it was achieved at roughly the time when I was driving my parents crazy with uh, foul smells from the basement where I was mixing chemicals in my chemistry set. Uh, 19, around 19, in the mid-1930s, they were unified. Uh, it, it's not that chemistry was reduced to physics. In fact, chemistry was proven to be irreducible to physics. Uh, physics was wrong. Uh, physics had to go, undergo a radical change, quantum theoretic revolution, uh, at which point it was possible to unify it with an essentially unchanged chemistry. Uh, prior to that, back as late as the, as recent as the 1920s, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winners and other famous scientists were saying that chemistry is just a mode of calculation. It's a metaphysical twaddle to consider uh, valence and the periodic table and uh, Bohr's atom and so on to have any reality. They're just ways of calculating chemical reactions. Well, 10 years later, that was dismissed because uh, physics changed and was unified with chemistry. Uh, and a conception of the two was achieved that made chemistry and physics part of the same thing, but not by reduction. Uh, reduction is pretty rare in the history of science. Uh, so not, you know, 20 years later, uh, a good deal of biology was unified with chemistry, but that was a radically, and physics, but only under a radical transformation of physics. In fact, the same people were involved, Linus Pauling. Uh, and, the, uh, and that's, you know, modern science as far as we understand it. Uh, still not unified with the core of standard science is uh, other aspects of the world like the mental aspects. Uh, we haven't figured out yet how to unify those with the rest of science. And nobody can tell, and we can only proceed as people proceeded in, for hundreds of years in chemistry, trying to construct a body of doctrine to account for the phenomena that you discover uh, and uh, make, it, make as much sense out of it as you can and look forward to some eventual unification, which may or may not take place, with other studies of other aspects of the world. And nobody can tell how that's going to happen. I mean, maybe it'll be necessary to radically change underlying physics in order to integrate it with uh, what might turn out to be an unchanged theory of the mind. Nobody can know those are things you wait for to see. Uh, well, this is not well understood, as I say, and in fact, in many ways, there's regression about these matters. If you look at the 17th and 18th century studies of, uh, about whether machines can think, in many ways, they are more sophisticated than contemporary work about these matters. Well, the second cognitive revolution picked up, reinvented uh, a lot of these ideas. Uh, it uh, 
sometimes, in, and it opened up the way to quite productive inquiry in some areas, although some of the, the major gaps still remain. Uh, the cognitive revolution of the second one of the 1950s uh, involved a radical shift of perspective as compared with structuralist and behaviorist and other prevalent approaches, uh, which viewed, let's keep the language, but it's general for cognition. Uh, it viewed uh, these behaviorist and structuralist approaches viewed language as uh, action, as behavior, or as the products of behavior, like texts. That's language. The uh, cognitive revolution introduced a change. It was concerned not with behavior or texts, but with inner mechanisms. That is, whatever the mechanisms are that are responsible for the behavior and the production of the texts and so on. Uh, that, uh, uh, so behavior just, and texts and, you know, corpus of materials and so on, they just become data, you know, like, like uh, what happens when you mix chemicals, just phenomena. They're of no inter it's of no interest in itself. Uh, they become of interest when they provide evidence for inner mechanisms, exactly as in chemistry. Uh, the phenomena themselves are dismissed. Uh, the, and the same with the behavior. Uh, if they provide evidence, fine. If they don't, throw it out. And there could be plenty of other kinds of evidence. There's nothing privileged about these kinds of evidence. Uh, the, uh, you, like you could get evidence someday from cellular biology or something else. Uh, the, uh, what you're interested in is the inner mechanisms that account for uh, what a person knows when they know a language, what it is that we roughly share, though not identical, of course. Uh, that's the shift of perspective in a whole range of fields, study of language, vision, uh, motor coordination, and so on. Uh, in the course of that, uh, uh, there was a good deal of reinvention of uh, traditional conceptions like those I mentioned. Uh, this approach was criticized at the time as being mentalist, uh, which is correct. It was mentalist, uh, meaning it was concerned with mental aspects of the world, and that's a move towards scientific naturalism. It's a move towards making the field more like, say, chemistry or biology or whatever, uh, because it's looking at the internal mechanisms and not at the phenomena which are now dismissed as essentially data unless they're useful for something. So the criticism was correct, but it wasn't criticism, it was praise, uh, though it wasn't conceived of that way. Uh, so we now are interested consciously in mental aspects of the world, like chemical aspects, try to figure out what they are, uh, to see if maybe someday it'll be possible to unify them with other kinds of inquiry. Uh, the approach was also uh, what's sometimes called internalist. That is, it's concerned with, it takes language to be a state of the brain. So my language is some state of my brain. Your language is some state of your brain. Now that's not the way we usually think of language in common sense. Uh, but common sense has centuries ago been dismissed as irrelevant to uh, the effort to understand how the world works. Uh, that's the great discovery of the scientific revolution. Uh, the way we think about language uh, is as a some kind of abstract entity which is outside of us. Uh, so we say that people in Shanghai and Beijing speak Chinese. Chinese is a language spoken by those people. And we say that uh, people in, uh, uh, on the other hand, we don't say, for example, that people in Rio de Janeiro and Bucharest speak the same language. Uh, we don't say that they both speak Romance. You know. uh, why do we say that people in Shanghai and Beijing speak Chinese, but people in Rio and Bucharest don't speak Romance. Well, not for any linguistic reason. Uh, that has to do with colors on maps and the stability of empires and things like that. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the nature of the systems. Uh, in fact, language, the way we use it, is some very complicated socio-political notion which has not much to do with things that are in people's heads. Uh, furthermore, it's a very obscure notion so it has normative aspects and teleological aspects. So you're supposed to go to school to learn how to speak good English or you know the right English because you don't know that or what's in your head somehow isn't the right English. Uh, that's somehow normative. Uh, what that, that I mean that's part of our culture, but it has no scientific meaning. Uh, sometimes it leads to complete absurdity, as in the debate over ebonics a year or two ago. In fact. Uh, as any scientist ought to understand or anyone uses their sense, if the people in East Oakland 
and happen to have all the money and power, uh, Ebonics would be good English, and what they talk at Princeton and Yale would be some weird kind of dialect or something like that. I mean, whatever these things are, they're not psychological or biological or linguistic notions. Uh, the teleological aspect is even more mystical. So like, say, take a three-year-old kid, uh, Peter, let's say. Uh, what language is Peter speaking? Well, there's no answer to that question in ordinary usage. She's not speaking any language. Of course, he's got linguistic knowledge. He understands all sorts of things and saying all kinds of new things and so on. But that's not a language. I mean, it's certainly not English. You know. In fact, what we say is Peter's on his way towards acquiring English. So it's teleological. There's like an end point. Uh, and if normal, under normal circumstances, he'll get there. But what he's talking is not a language at all. It's nothing. And, uh, on the other hand, if, say, all children, all adults were to some die, let's say, and all kids three years old were to survive somehow, then down the road, these three-year-olds would be speaking, which is just one of the possible human languages, just as much as Japanese or Hungarian or anything else, except it wouldn't be English. It would be something sort of like English, but different, because it would have matured and developed in a different way. But we have no way of talking about those things in ordinary usage. Uh, uh, which just means that ordinary usage has to be abandoned if we hope to uh, understand the nature of these systems. If we hope to understand what human beings are like, we're going to have to pay attention to how to adopt an internalist approach and to look at states of the mind, states of the brain, we assume, uh, which uh, are the language, languages that people know. Uh, you and I can communicate to the extent that our internal states are more or less similar. But communication is a more or less affair. It's not a yes or no affair. Uh, when you listen to me, your linguistic faculties, that component of your brain, reflexively uh, carries out sensory adaptations so you can accommodate my own speech, you know, in terms of your somewhat different speech. That's all reflexive. You have no control over it. And you reflexively assign interpretations to what I'm saying. Uh, uh, Sometimes it doesn't work, you know, but over a substantial range it does. Again, that's completely reflexive. There's no possible conscious control. Uh, consciousness could enter. Like, for example, if you miss some words that I'm saying, you might consciously try to reconstruct what they might have been. Uh, but uh, that's what communication is. You know, it's a, a matter of sort of more or less uh, mostly reflexive, uh, sometimes impossible, uh, uh, and uh, there's nothing more to say about it. There's no such thing as English, the thing we all speak. Uh, to say that two spe people speak the same language, say that you and I speak English, is kind of like saying that uh, two people live near one another. Uh, there's no right answer to whether they live near one another. Like if we're talking to somebody from Mars, we might say that you live near me in Boston. On the other hand, if we're asking if I could get here by bicycle, you know, we'd say, no, we don't live near one another. Uh, there's no right answer to that. The world isn't divided into areas, you know, and some people are in the same area and others are in different areas. And the story about languages is about the same, except that the multidimensionality and complexity is far greater. Well, those are cha changes of orientation that have to be inter accepted and understood if one hopes to try to figure out what human beings are like. What are these? What's the nature of these properties? And so there's no contradiction at all between taking this internalist point of view and being interested in questions of uh, uh, relation, the use of language in power relations or for domination or for unifying people or whatever, sociolinguistic concerns. These are mutually supportive uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, just as if you're studying bees, let's say. Uh, you can study bee communities and you can study the internal nature of bees, and those are not in conflict. In fact, they're mutually supportive. If you want to understand bee communities, uh, if you're serious about it, you're going to ask, what are bees like? What's their internal nature? And the same is true if you want to understand human communities, the various complicated kinds of human communities and the way humans, that language enters into them. Uh, that relies crucially on whatever understanding we have about the internal nature of humans. I mention this because although this is taken for granted in the study of bees, it's considered highly controversial, if not outrageous, in the study of humans, uh, which is one aspect of the general irrationality 
uh, with which human affairs are studied. Why that's true, we could ask, but it's definitely true. If we're rational about it, there's no conflict whatsoever. Uh, well, what do we find when we look at, we try to look at humans the way we would look at, uh, you know, chemical elements or anything else in the natural world, uh, looking at their linguistic aspects? Uh, the first thing we discover, which is already obvious centuries ago, is that language is apparently a species, a, a species property. It's something specific to humans. Uh, it has very little variation within the species. So aside from really extreme pathology, humans are basically identical in their language faculties. Uh, there's no, you're not genetically determined to learn Chinese or English or anything like that. You just have the same language faculties. Uh, and it's also biologically quite isolated as far as anyone knows. There are no cousins, you know. There's no, uh, uh, there's not, not only no variation within the species, but there's no similar organisms. Now you have to go quite far to find even superficial similarities. Uh, maybe the closest similarities are actually with insects, with bees. Uh, so bees are, have a complicated, every organism has some kind of communication system, but the bee communication system, uh, uh, I, I should say it's, it's, it's phenomenal character is very well understood, it's very well described, but nobody has any idea how it works. Uh, the physiology isn't understood, nobody would even dream of talking about the evolution of it, it's way too complex. The bees are a lot simpler than we are, uh, but these things are not understood for bees and surely not for humans. In any event, the bee communication system has some of the properties of human language. Uh, for example, one striking property of human language is what's sometimes called displaced reference. Uh, I can talk to you about the arrangement of books in my study in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you can understand me. We're talking about things that aren't in our sensory field, right? So that's displaced reference. That's normal human behavior. Uh, it's also normal bee behavior. So bees, when they do their dance, uh, are communicating to other bees about something remote that's not in their sensory field, like a flower and where it is and what kind of a flower it is and you know, how much uh, honey you can get from it and so on and so forth. Uh, that property, displaced reference, is extremely rare in the animal world. In fact, it's really known only in bees and humans. Uh, it's been, there have been attempts to artificially impose it on other primates, like apes. And there's some anecdotal evidence that maybe this is possible, but nothing you, know, nothing you could call scientific evidence. In any event, what's, it's certainly not the normal communicative behavior, as far as we know at least, of organisms other than uh, humans and insects. But of course, there's no evolutionary connection, like there's a distance of, I don't know, a billion years or something. Uh, the, uh, uh, you can find vocal learning in other organisms, songbirds, are the only known organism that has vocal learning. But it's evolved independently in several species of songbirds and in different ways. For some of them, it's kind of like a fixed pattern. For others, it adapts to the vocal environment and so on. It would be completely senseless to study the language, if the song of one, song of one species by looking at the song of another species that evolved separately. And that'll teach you nothing and even more madly senseless to uh, try to study human language by comparing it to things like this. Uh, the, uh, there is a lot of uh, kind of you know, sentimental uh, interest in uh, relating in trying to show that other primates like gorillas or you know, chimpanzees and so on can have some of the superficial properties of humans. I mean, I don't know what the scientific interest of this is, probably nil, but uh, and probably the worst way to study intelligence of primates. But there's a lot of work on that. Uh, and you'll read anecdotal stories about it and some scientific evidence, in fact. Uh, but um, it's mis totally misunderstood. I mean, if you could show that some other primate had properties like human language, uh, that would not be, that would not be a challenge to the study of language at all. In fact, it wouldn't affect the study of human language at all. It would affect uh, general biology. It would be a biological miracle, in fact. It would be a major challenge to the theory of evolution. Uh, and therefore, one wants strong evidence for it before you challenge a well-established theory like the theory of evolution. You really want strong evidence. But this has almost nothing to do, it has no more to do with the study of human language than if you could, 
demonstrate that uh, you know humans could really fly. It's just that nobody had thought to teach them of the right way of moving their arms around or something. I mean, if you found that out, it wouldn't affect the study of eagle flight. That would continue exactly the way it does, but it would challenge the theory of evolution radically. I mean, how come humans had this amazing capacity with its enormous uh, selectional advantages and never thought of using it until some Martian came along or something? So that would be pretty strange, but uh, it has nothing to do with theory of eagle flight and the study of primate communication. It has nothing to do with study of human language. It tells you nothing. Uh, as far as we understand these, so again, this is a species-specific char characteristic which furthermore evolved extremely recently. Uh, it seems to have evolved, as far as anybody knows, in maybe 100,000 years or so, which is like the flick of an eye from the point of view of evolution. And about at a distance of a roughly 15 million years, double the point of separation uh, from other primates. Uh, that just seems to be a fact about it. Uh, and there's no analogies in other organisms and certainly no homologous structures that anyone knows about and no variation within the species, which makes the study of human evolution seem uh, very, uh, uh, evolution of the capacity seem extremely difficult. Most serious evolutionary biologists consider it to be impossible because the uh, kinds of evidence that would be relevant are just not present, like related species or variation in the species and so on. Uh, the, uh, at the moment, there is no serious reason to doubt the Cartesian assumption that the ability, I'm quoting Descartes, the ability to use language to express freely formed thoughts is the true difference between man and animal or between man and automaton, and that's true whether you're talking about the automata of the 17th century or today's automata, computers and so on. The problems are the same. Nothing changes. Uh, so you can take a modern computer, it's no different in these respects from an old-fashioned clock. Uh, other respects, but not these. Uh, the faculty of language also has structural properties that are bi biologically isolated as far as we know. They don't appear, appear elsewhere in the organic world. Uh, the most elementary of them, the most simple, is so what's called discrete infinity. It's a property that's illustrated most strikingly in the natural numbers, you know, one, two, three, four of those. Uh, there, there aren't any numbers in between three and four. I mean, you know, there's other numbers, but not natural, not integers, not natural numbers, and they go on indefinitely. So there's no biggest one. Uh, these are things that children know somehow. They can't learn them. There's no way for a child to learn things like this. If you don't already know it, you can't learn it. No amount of experience could tell you that. You know, if you've heard the numbers up to seven, that there's going to be another one, uh, or up to you know nine zillion, that there's going to be another one. Uh, that's just something you have to know, and it's a way you, it's like the Cartesian story about triangles. It's got to come from inside. And as far as we know, no other organism has that capacity or the similar capacity that shows up in language. So somehow a child knows that there can be three word sentences and four word sentences, but no three and a half word sentences, uh, and it goes on indefinitely. You can always make up more complicated ones without limit. And they do. In fact, that's standard for very young children. So all of this stuff somehow comes from inside. It's an expression of the genes we now assume. Uh, the, when you move to less elementary properties than this, the conclusion has just become more striking. You find all sorts of properties of language that just seem to have no analog, let alone homologous organs elsewhere in the biological world. And again, very recent as far as we know. Well. Take some, you know, take this, uh, take this kid, Peter, again. Imagine that Peter is an infant, say, just born, uh, and has a pet kitten and a pet chimpanzee or whatever you like. Uh, they're going to go along certain courses of growth and development, which are partially similar and partially different. So in, in uh, matters like, say, spatial orientation, like ha what, what, what is a infant or a kitten do when you disorient it in, a, in space? What kind of cues does it use to reorient? Pretty complicated thing. Turns out that kittens and infants are about the same. They do it pretty much the same ways. Uh, on the other hand, uh, interpreting the linguistic signals that go on, they do it in totally different ways. In fact, the kitten and the chimpanzee and so on don't do it at all. 
uh, but the infant just does it reflexively and very early. In fact, probably, uh, uh, it's probably intrauterine. Uh, as early as you can do, the experimental techniques are getting better and better, and as you do experiments with younger and younger infants, it turns out they already know almost anything you can test. Uh, when uh, uh, it's already been shown that with infants just a couple of days old, uh, they can distinguish the language of their mother from other languages. Uh, and it happens in very strange ways when you start comparing the languages that they identify and don't identify. So something's going on pre-birth, which is already setting the language faculty in motion and in specific ways. Uh, by the time the infant's a couple of months old, long before it's producing anything, uh, it's uh, already got the main intonational structure of the language fixed, knows whether it's Polish or Japanese and so on, and a little later all sorts of other things. Well before children are talking more than, let's say, one word or two words, they're understanding quite complex sentences, and you can show that experimentally. They can even determine the meaning of nonsense words from complex utterances and so on. And all of this stuff is just happening. It's not anything the child is learning any more than the child is learning to have arms and legs. It's just a form of growth. You know, some kind of growth of this faculty is taking place, uh, like the visual system is growing and you're getting binocular vision and uh, learning motor coordination, what we call learning, acquiring motor coordination and so on. Uh, these are apparently just things that happen to a child and, and don't happen to other organisms that have the same experience, like the child's pet chimpanzee. Uh, the faculty of language is somehow identifying linguistic experience, linguistic phenomena, as a separate category of phenomena. And that's not so easy. You can't, nobody knows how to construct a computer program that'll do this. It's, uh, but somehow children are picking out the linguistic phenomena from the whole mass of junk that's going on uh, and operating on those phenomena in a highly specific fashion using properties like those I mentioned and much more complicated ones. Uh, and again, all of that sounds, uh, it looks as if it's biologically isolated and common to the species. Uh, there's some variation, uh, so English isn't Swahili. Uh, but the variation has got to be superficial uh, because the states that are attained are so intricate and special and highly articulated as compared with the data available that there's no way it could be a reflection of the data available. It's just got to come from the inside uh, from which you expect, and one of the tasks of study is to try to prove that English and Swahili are really virtually identical. If some Martian was looking at humans, uh, we'd regard them as minor variations on the same system. Just the way we regard differences among rats as minor differences. You don't really care about them. They're all rats. Uh, the, uh, 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 we know from that other components of the mind-brain also undergo some variation. So you can show experimentally that uh, the visual system uh, takes slight, somewhat different forms, sometimes pretty radically different forms, uh, as a result of minor changes in early experience. This can be shown with cats and monkeys and other organisms that people allow themselves to experiment with. And since the human visual system is pretty much like the general mammalian visual system, it's assumed that the same is true of the human visual system. Uh, in the case of language, those differences are what we call different languages, but they're They've got to be mostly the same structure and character and semantics and so on with minor variations. And one of the major tasks of the contemporary study of language is to try to prove that. Uh, we have good reason to believe it must be true. And much work is, trying to, is devoted to trying to show that if you make little changes in the uh, fundamental properties of language, you get superficially different systems, but all sort of cast to the same mold. That's been one of the major research topics, particularly the last 10 or 15 years, and it's made quite substantial progress in typologically quite different languages. Uh, well, if there were time, which there isn't, uh, I would try to give some illustrations of the kinds of things that extremely young children know, which go way beyond any kind of evidence they have. Uh, there's no doubt that this is true, and it leaves us with no alternative but to assume that uh, somehow these systems grow out of our nature. You know there's an initial state of the language faculty, which is just some expression of the genes, and from then a process of growth and maturation takes place, 
obviously influenced by the environment, but that's true of every other system too, and it leads to the uh, mature state of the language faculty that we all have. Uh, that's true not just of, uh, you know, complicated uh, sentences, not particularly, you know, five-word sentences are enough to illustrate the intricacy of these things. It's also true of individual words. Uh, so if you just think of the simplest part of language, the meaning of words, it turns out that these two are uh, constructions of the mind, not reflections of experience, very much in the way that Descartes thought. Uh, actually, this was this is another topic that was studied rather intensively in the 17th and 18th century in ways which are only beginning to be rediscovered today. So take, say, uh, you know, the Mississippi River, uh, concept river, which every young child understands. Uh, Thomas Hobbes already 350 years ago recognized that this is a very complicated concept. Uh, what makes, how do we know that something is the same river? What makes something a river? You know, why is the Mississippi a river? What changes in the Mississippi would make it a different river? Well, Hobbes thought about this and he recognized that it wasn't the stuff that's in it. Like you could, the stuff that's in it could be 95% uh, chemical pollutants, and probably is, you know, but it would still be the Mississippi River, even though it's not water anymore, it's some other thing flowing down it. Uh, and he also recognized that you could change the course of the river artificially, like you could make it go somewhere else, uh, but it would still be the Mississippi River. Uh, and he concluded that what makes something a river is its origin. So it has to have the same origin, and then all sorts of radical changes can take place, but it's still a river. Uh, well, that's a mental construction. That's not like the earth sciences have no such concept. Uh, but if you think about it a little more, it's way more complicated than that. I mean, it can't be the origin. For example, you can reverse the course of a river, and it can be the same river. Uh, one of the great engineering projects attempted in Russia was to reverse the course of the Volga. Well, suppose it had succeeded. It still would have been the Volga. You know, it just would have been going in the opposite direction. Uh, it would still be the same river. Or you could take the Mississippi and uh, separate it into different streams, you know, and make them come together somewhere else where they never had before. And although it was separate things along its course, if it, under a variety of conditions, it would still be the Mississippi River, despite those changes. So you can change the, in fact, you could change the point of origin and have the spring, of the you know, things it comes from start somewhere else and could still be the Mississippi River. There's a wide variety of variations under which it would still be the same river. On the other hand, not all variations. In fact, some very slight variations would turn it into something else. So like suppose there was an ice age and the Mississippi froze, you know, it was all ice, still the same contents, maybe pure H2O. And suppose you sort of put some chemical over the top that prevented cars from skidding on it, and you used it as a highway. Uh, so it was the highway to get from wherever it goes to. Well, it wouldn't be a river anymore. Now it would be a road. You know, I mean, it's, vert it's from the physicist's point of view, it's identical, essentially, to what it was before, but it's not a river. It's a road for humans. Uh, and you can proceed with that. Whatever the concept river is that every young child knows, is extremely intricate. And uh, no, no child has any evidence about these things. Like no one, you know, and you don't find it in dictionaries. For example, if you look up the word river in a dictionary, it doesn't tell you any of these things uh, quite correctly because these are all things that come from our nature. It would be a mistake for the dictionary to tell you about them even if they knew about them, which they don't. Uh, uh, but uh, these are research topics, really. Uh, but uh, what a dictionary does is give you hints. It gives you a few hints that you can then use uh, to make your innate capacities and innate mental structures construct the concept out of its own nature. And that's true of every uh, word in the language. Uh, river, uh, the, the words, our, our words and our concepts are what uh, David Hume called fictitious constructions. That is, constructions of our imagination on the occasion of sense. That's why they're the same for all languages. So if we were talking Japanese, uh, I could have given the same examples, and you can be certain that they would work uh, because they're independent of experience. They just come from our inner nature. Now, e every word you think about is like this. Uh, so take, say, the word book. Uh, suppose the library has uh, uh, two copies of, say, Joyce's Ulysses, and Peter takes one and Tom takes another. Uh, did they take the same book or did they take different books? <laughs> 
Well, you know, it depends on how you're thinking about it. From one point of view, they took out the same book, namely Joyce's Ulysses. From another point of view, they took out different books, you know, two different physical objects. Uh, you can take the abstract and material point of view. This, these are points noticed already by Aristotle, I should say. Uh, you can take the uh, you can you, you can take both perspectives simultaneously, so you can say John took out Ulysses and memorized it, and Bill took it out and burned it. Okay, uh, notice that I'm referring to it by the pronoun it. Well, what's it referring to? Well, it's referring to an abstract object. That's what the first guy, I forget his name, memorized, uh, and a physical object. That's what the second guy burned. Uh, suppose I say. Uh, John's book is in every bookstore in the country. Well, is it one thing or many things? Well, it's one thing. He has one book. It's the only book he ever wrote. Uh, on the other hand, it's many things because you can find it in Chicago and New York and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's just what a book is. You know, it's some really weird object which is both material and immaterial, abstract and concrete, uh, you know, a lot of places and one place and so on. Uh, these are things that everyone knows about the word, but without any experience or instruction or looking it up in the dictionary or anything like that. In fact, again, you don't find any such things in dictionaries. Well, uh, these are the, the topics of, st these are the most elementary cases. As soon as you begin to look at, I'll just give one example of a slightly more complex case uh, to illustrate. Uh, suppose I say that, uh, suppose there's a chicken over there, and I say the chicken's ready to eat. Well, that's ambiguous. It can mean the chicken is getting prepared to you know, pick up a piece of corn or whatever it is chickens eat. Or it could mean that uh, we're ready to eat the chicken. Okay, So the chicken is properly cooked. Chicken's ready to eat. Uh, uh, suppose I say the chicken is ready to be eaten. Okay, Well, it's still ambiguous. But if you think about it carefully, it's ambiguous in different ways. I mean, it could mean the chicken is ready it's, you know, it's, it realizes it's going to be eaten and it's ready, like the man getting, you know, prepared to be, he's, he's ready to be executed, you know, the guy on death row. Could mean that, or it could mean that the chicken is properly prepared to be eaten. So it has an ambiguity, but I leave it as an exercise. If you think it through, it's a different ambiguity from the first one. Uh, suppose I replace the word ready by hard, let's say. I say the chicken is hard to eat. Well, it loses the ambiguity. You know, now it just means one thing. It's, it's hard for us to eat the chicken. Suppose I take the second sentence and replace ready by hard. The chicken is ready to be eaten. The chicken is hard to be eaten. You know, that doesn't mean anything. You know. For some reason, that just doesn't work. You know. uh, the, uh, whatever the principles of our language faculty are, they give you ambiguities in some cases, different ambiguities in other cases, no ambiguities in third cases, and nothing at all in other cases. Uh, and all that's happening is you're replacing one adjective by another, you know, uh, or making some slight change in the context. Well, to figure out what's going on here is no trivial matter. Uh, these are extremely simple sentences, I should say, way below the level of complexity that young children deal with. Uh, but uh, what they're doing with them is very obscure, and in fact, research projects to try to figure it out. Uh, but certainly not being taught. I mean. Kids never get any instruction about these things. They're never told they're wrong. They never make mistakes about it. It's the same in all languages. Uh, and uh, again, as you move on to more complex cases, you simply find more and more of this. Well, uh, let me just end up. The current work is concerned with this. There has been a lot of progress in this range of topics, trying to find out what the fixed principles are that make language come out the way it does. You know, What are the fixed? innate principles, presumably expressions of the genes, that make language come out this way in the meanings of words, the meanings of complicated expressions, their form, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's been a lot of progress, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, in studying the acquisition of these systems. And as I mentioned, it's been discovered more and more that as you improve the experimental techniques, you figure out ways of doing tests with young infants, which is not so simple, but there are ways. As the experimental techniques get better, you keep discovering that more and more is known early on. And just how far this is going to go, you can only speculate. Uh, but uh, 
a, a fair amount is known about, something is known about the use of these things, like how do we use these expressions to deal with each other and the world and so on. That's harder, but something's known. Uh, brain mechanisms is a, really a topic for the future. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's been extremely hard to find out how the brain is doing these things. Uh, part of the reason is, is just ethical. Uh, we don't permit ourselves, rightly, uh, to torture children uh, the way you torture other creatures. That might be wrong, too, but anyway, whatever the ethics are, we do permit ourselves to torture cats and monkeys. Uh, and that means you can learn a lot about how they work. You know, you can learn a lot about the visual system or the uh, motor coordination system or whatever of uh, other organisms because you can do direct experimentation. In the case of humans, you can't. Now, we do learn about the human visual system from these experiments because it's more or less the same. So by analogy, you figure out, you figure humans are about the same. Uh, but there are no analogous systems in other organisms. So you can't study the language faculty of a kitten or a monkey or something and ask how it works because it isn't there, you know, as far as we know. So you can't learn anything from experimentation with other organisms and we don't do intrusive experiments with humans or raising children in controlled environments and so on. Uh, experiments you can imagine which probably would teach you a lot about what's going on, maybe very lot. Uh, it's possible that, and a lot of hope that with contemporary technology, with brain imaging technology that's non-intrusive, you know, or uh, picking up electrical activity of the brain, which is non-intrusive, it may be possible to overcome some of these limits. And in fact, some things are being discovered, but it's still pretty rudimentary. Uh, how the brain is doing these things is really not understood. And as I say, that should not really surprise us. Uh, for much simpler organisms like bees, it's also not understood. Uh, and in fact, the well, fact of the matter is when you get beyond big molecules, uh, understanding tends to tail off rather rapidly. Uh, when you get to things like humans, you know, it's, you're really far out. Uh, the, uh, uh, but those are topics for the future. Uh, on the question of evolution, the evolution of the system, right now it looks like a hopeless topic. There's nothing, the ways in which evolution is studied uh, don't seem to provide you with any relevant data. Uh, maybe somebody will figure something else out, but uh, right now it doesn't look all that hopeful, although something happened. I mean, nobody doubts, seriously doubts that it did evolve. Uh, there are some new topics coming on the agenda which uh, are, have been lead just in the last couple of years which are leading to pretty exciting work, I think. Uh, th those are questions having to do with optimality of language design. So sort of imagine the following fairy tale. It is a fairy tale. Uh, its only merit is it's not crazier than other fairy tales about the evolution of language, equally crazy. Uh, but uh, suppose, for example, that there was a primate wandering around a couple hundred thousand years ago, uh, ancestor of ours, uh, which was just like us, except it didn't have a language faculty. Uh, it had the same thoughts, you know, insofar as it doesn't require language to express thoughts. It had the same sensory motor apparatus, uh, same perceptions, and so on. It just didn't have, if it had thoughts, it had no way to communicate them. You know. So it didn't have a language faculty, but it was otherwise the same. Uh, suppose some shower of cosmic rays or something came along uh, and caused a mutation, which might be a small mutation, uh, which led to a reorganization of the brain, uh, inserting a language faculty. I mean, we do know in physical systems that very slight changes can lead to radical changes of state, you know, like the difference between water and ice, for example. Uh, and uh, maybe let's imagine that happened. So, the rest of the system stayed essentially the same, but now it's got a language faculty inserted. Well, what's that language faculty have, what does it have to do? Well, what it, it has to be accessible to the sensory motor apparatus, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't even know you had it. In fact, maybe another organism does have it, but has no access to it. Could be, you know, not likely, but logically possible. So one thing this language faculty would have to do would be to be accessible to the articulatory organs and the auditory system and so on. That's a condition it has to meet. Uh, the other condition it has to meet is that it has to be accessible to whatever the system of thought is. About that we don't know very much, except we know it's there. Um, infants do think about things, animals think about things and so on. There's some kind of system of thought and the language faculty has to be accessible to it in order to express the thoughts or construct the thoughts and so on. Uh, 
So here are two external conditions that the language faculty has to meet. That means if the language faculty is going to do anything at all, it has to have some kind of representations of sound or other externalizable forms, maybe sign, uh, and it has to have representations of thought. Uh, and those are the only conditions it has to meet. Uh, we can think of them as design specifications. If you're going to design, if a super engineer were going to design the system, it would have to meet those conditions. Well, the question that you can ask, at least in principle, is how good a design is it? Uh, how perfectly is language designed to meet just the minimal conditions that are imposed by the output constraints? You know, if this fairy tale were true, how good a system would have emerged? Would it be one that some super engineer would have devised, or would it be kind of like a mess, like most things in the biological world are? You know, they just develop out of whatever materials are around in the best way possible. And they're usually pretty messy. Uh, like, for example, the human spine. I mean, every person knows that it's pretty badly engineered. You know? uh, in fact, probably badly engineered for big mammals altogether, except cows don't know how to complain about back pains and so on. Uh, but whatever happened, it does, you know, works as well as it works, but it certainly, you know, some engineer from MIT could figure out a smarter way to do it. Uh, so the question is, uh, is starting from scratch. You know, evolution doesn't start from scratch. It starts from whatever's around at a particular time and does the best it can. And what comes out is usually more or less of a mess. Uh, the, uh, so would it, to what extent is it the case that this system, which apparently emerged very rapidly, like flick of an eye, uh, to what extent is it well designed? Uh, well, that turns out to be a about 10 years ago, you couldn't have even dreamed of asking such a question. Now you can formulate it in more or less sensible ways. In the last couple of years, there have been some interesting work on it, which seems to indicate that language is remarkably well designed. Uh, that is, it's pretty close to optimal design. In cases where linguists have been assuming complex structure that isn't motivated by external conditions, it turns out to be wrong in many cases. And it turns out there's simpler ways of doing it that doesn't use that. Well, if this continues on this path, uh, we might reach the very surprising conclusion that this organ, which is apparently uniquely human, uh, is even an optimal, something like an optimally designed organ just to satisfy design, out the minimal design specifications. That would be extremely surprising. Um, it would mean that language is more like a kind of like a snowflake than it's like a giraffe's neck or something. Uh, it's something that's just the way it is because that's what physics and chemistry tell you it's got to be. You know, there weren't any other choices. Uh, whether that'll actually turn out you know, is anybody's guess, but there is work pointing in that direction, uh, which is kind of exciting, both in that it's changing the ways we think about language and also um, has implications for uh, biology and the study of humans that would be pretty striking if they're anywhere near true. Uh, that's roughly, I think, where things stand. There are lots of problems that are on the horizon. You can think of how to investigate them and so on. There are some problems that remain as mysterious as they always were, like the Cartesian problems. Uh, how can we use language in the creative fashion that we do? That's not even a question. Nobody knows how to raise a meaningful question about it. And that's not just true of the study of language. That's true of every aspect of uh, behavior or performance. So for example, people study motor coordination, which turns out to be a hard topic. Like how can I reach for you know this, a glass on the table and get there? It turns out to be extremely hard to construct a robot that'll do that. You know, it involves all sorts of complicated planning and control of the elbow and all sorts of stuff. So it's a hard problem and a lot has been learned about how it can be done in principle and even something about what the physiology is involved. But nobody even asks the question, why do I reach for the cup on the table and not a uh, pen on the floor? You know, I mean, that's not even a question. So nobody studies that. Uh, the same is true of, say, the visual system. Uh, you can invent, which is a passive system, it's a receptive system, not active, but it does have active elements. Like if you take an ambiguous figure, you know, a figure that can be seen either, say, as a duck or a rabbit or something like that, uh, it turns out that with train, you know, with, n nobody knows how you do it, so it's hard to say training, but with something that you do internally that you don't understand, you can get yourself to a stage where you can make yourself see one or the other. You know, 
not 100%, but you can get a strong bias towards seeing one or the other, and it's partly under control. Uh, sometimes under, if you really work on it, it's under considerable control. Uh, so there's some voluntary act involved in what you see. That's probably to ordinary vision too, you know, like in ordinary experience, you're making some kinds of choices, you're not thinking about them, and maybe they're unconscious, uh, but it's under some kind of control. But these are not, although people learn a lot about the visual system and study it, they don't study these questions. Nobody studies how you can decide to see one or another figure in a Necker cube or something like that. These are topics that are just outside the range of investigation. Uh, and in the case of language, it's, you know, it's the striking example that, in fact, impressed Descartes. And that divide between uh, acts of will or you know, indeterm uh, undetermined but appropriate action uh, remains as much of a mystery as it ever was. There's no progress at all towards solving it, not even any bad ideas. Uh, nobody knows why. Maybe it's some limitation of our intelligence or something else. Uh, but anyhow, that's roughly the way things stand. So the Cartesian divide is where it was uh, on other topics like how the mechanisms work and what's their nature and so on. There's been uh, quite considerable progress and a lot of exciting work to do. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Microcephalic people, what are their language properties? Well, that's a very dramatic fact. It turns out that people with extremely small brains, uh, uh, anencephalic dwarves, they're called, nevertheless seem to have, there are cases where they have a functioning language faculty. Uh, that was actually discovered by um, the person who really started modern biology of language, Eric Lenneberg, who's an old friend and classmate of mine, died a couple years ago. Uh, but one of his early discoveries was about this. Again, nobody understands why. Uh, in fact, they have plenty of other cognitive capacities. Some of them do higher mathematics. Yeah. Uh, these are just things that aren't understood. Is there a lower limit? Nobody knows. You know? I mean, again, you can't do experiments, right? We, we exclude the possibility of experiments. So what you're left with is what are called natural experiments. But natural experiments are extremely messy. You know? For example, you can study you can study what we call pathological development, you know, meaning not normal development, or you can study uh, injury. So a lot has been learned from, say, aphasia, you know, a guy. But, you know, studying aphasia is like trying to figure out how a computer works by hitting it with a crowbar and seeing what happens. You know, you know a lot of things happen, but uh, it's not the best way to figure out how a computer works. Uh, and when somebody has aphasia, it's, whoops, you lost something. Uh, it's, uh, it's just like some damage that took place through nature, you know, that's not a controlled experiment. And so the results are interesting, but very but limited. Contemporary philosophers like Whitehead 
uh, talk about the difference between physical and mental as if that means something, but it doesn't mean anything because we have no notion of physical. That's the Newtonian discovery. There is no notion of physical. So we can't talk about the difference between <coughs> physical and mental. We can only talk about different aspects of the world. Uh, there, the old concept of physical, you know, the one in the mechanical philosophy, that's gone forever. And nobody's ever invented a new one, and no, no scientist would even try. The physical is whatever there is. You know, that's the physical. Uh, and among the things there are, are the mental aspects of the world, like thought, say. Uh, what, a, what is an abstract object? Well, that's a kind of a curious notion. Uh, for example, the things that scientists study are abstract objects. Like, a f uh, say, somebody, somebody studying planetary motion, for example. I mean, they're not, you know, a, a theory of planetary motion isn't concerned with, you know, asteroids going by or the effects of Alpha Centauri or, you know, all sorts of other stuff. They're studying, an a they're studying planetary motion in abstraction from the full complexity. And you're always studying things in abstraction from the full complexity. Actually, that's why people do experiments. The point of doing experiments is to try to get rid of a lot of the complexity of the natural world that somehow you assume isn't relevant. Of course, you can't do it 100% because the world is always there. But the point of experiments is to try to get rid of as much as you can. So I suppose a geneticist is studying fruit flies or something. Uh, the geneticist is going to want to make those fruit flies as identical as possible and will pretend they are in fact identical, but of course knows perfectly well that they aren't. Uh, but what you're doing is studying them in abstraction from a lot of their properties. So everything we're studying is an abstract object. There's no way to proceed in any <coughs> other terms. Uh, this is sometimes called idealization, but that's a highly misleading term because idealization s suggests to people that you're moving away from reality, and it's the opposite. You do idealization because you're trying to get to reality. You're trying to cut away the interfering factors that keep you from understanding reality. So therefore, you idealize to abstract things. Uh, but that's a way of finding out what reality is. You know, it's not just this massive junk going on around you. That's a useless mess. Uh, you want to understand reality, you're going to have to try to find out what's going on, which means abstracting and idealizing and so on. Uh, this is the core of science since, since Galileo. And Whitehead, of all people, should have known it. He did very important work on the 17th century. So these concepts, we can't really make a lot of sense out of. Uh, he certainly would. Yeah. He was using, he wasn't using words, but they didn't mean the same thing. Yeah. They did, they did. Or now. But now they don't mean anything. I mean, now there is no physical mental distinction because there's no physical. Okay. And as far as abstraction is concerned, it's a complicated idea. Uh, but there's still, I'm not saying there's nothing to the point. There is. But we have to be careful in thinking about what he meant by it. You know, uh, He's not introducing polar distinctions of the kind that might come to mind if you don't think too hard. Uh, but uh, what about mathematics as uh, you know, ideal language? Well, that's a metaphor. I mean, asking to say that language, uh, mathematics is a language is just a metaphoric use of the notion of language. I mean, it's a little bit like saying, suppose somebody were to say, look, humans <coughs> can really fly. In fact, at the last Olympics, they flew about 30 feet or so. Uh, which is, after all, not very different from chickens. You know, the, the <laughs> championship for chicken flight, I think, is around 300 feet, you know, one order of magnitude, no, no big deal. Uh, so chick people fly kind of like chickens, and they're both very different from eagles. You know. Well, I mean, maybe some Martian didn't understand what organisms are like might say that, but it'd be a really stupid comment. I mean, it's true that humans fly more or less like chickens, and neither are like eagles, but that's not the way it works. Chickens fly like eagles, and humans don't fly at all, you know, uh, even though there are homologous organs involved in this case, like, you know, arms are sort of homologous to wings. Uh, but uh, so to say that humans fly would be kind of like a metaphor. It would be like saying submarines swim or something. <coughs> yeah, you can say it if you want, but it's just metaphoric. And the same is true when you say that mathematics is a language. It certainly doesn't have the properties of human language. A human language is a natural phenomenon, you know, uh, which is part of the biological world. Mathematics shares some properties with it. 
you know, it doesn't have most of the properties of language and it has properties that language doesn't have. Uh, mathematics is a human creation. I mean, it's, if you're a sort of a Platonist, you know, you think there really are numbers out there, uh, then which most mathematicians do, and it's not a dumb idea, it's hard to think of any other intelligible explanation of the fact that you can discover truths of arithmetic, but whatever that means, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not, it, it's not like language. I mean, you use natural language in doing mathematics, but you use it in doing everything else too. You know? uh, and when you're really doing technical mathematics, you sort of discard the language side. I mean, you may use it informally, you know, when you're talking to your students and colleagues, but you mean them to understand that it's really something else, you know, and they should throw away all the connotations and so on. Uh, the uh, so, so it's, it's, it, you can't really answer the question. I mean, ma mathematics is what it is, you know. Uh, as to whether mathematics is a way of bringing things together, well, w w I mean, ha that's a question of applied mathematics. How can you use mathematics in dealing with the world? And the answer is that as your conception of things gets clearer and clearer, you know, you can move closer and closer towards giving what we call mathematical formulations, which just mean precise formulations. Uh, we call it mathematics when it's simple enough. Mathematics, mathematicians have, you know, a kind of a, a special uh, dispensation that scientists don't have. They're allowed to stop working when it gets too complicated. So they, in fact, it's kind of like a joke among mathematicians that the only numbers that exist are one, two, maybe three, and infinity. The others are just too complicated to think about. Uh, and uh, there's something to that. I mean, mathematics, you know, real mathematics is the study of extremely simple structures. And sometimes the study of extremely simple structures happens to shed surprising light on the nature of the world. That's when you have applied mathematics. But uh, most of the time that doesn't happen. So nobody does a mathematics of biology or something like that. Because the things you understand are just way too complicated to have any interesting mathematics about. Mathematics, you have mathematics when you start proving theorems and that sort of thing. Uh, and in the case of language, I mean, you know, there's, I mean, I've worked on it too. There's a thing called mathematical linguistics, which is the study of systems that have some of the properties of language, but are simplified enough so you can actually prove some theorems about them. And, you know, it's, it's of whatever interest it is. I mean, you have to <laughs> look and see, but uh, uh, it's like studying other systems that you abstract from reality and investigate because they're interesting on their own. Maybe because you hope to learn something about the real world by looking at their properties. But there's no other sense in which mathematics can mediate between things. Uh, I can't, yeah. Well, there are you know, analogies between language and music, and they've been studied. Uh, there, I, I don't want to find talk about it, and I don't know, don't know much about it, but there's interesting work. There's a, a Leonard Bernstein actually did a, had a book on this. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it was rather, it was the Charles Norton, Elliot Norton lectures that he gave at Harvard about 20 years ago or so, uh, which he tried to develop analogies between language and music. There were various people who were dissatisfied with the way he did it and tried other ways. Uh, the best known case is a joint work by a very good linguist, Ray Jackendoff, and a modern composer, Fred Lerdahl. Jackendoff's also a near professional musician himself. Uh, they did a book, again, forget the title, uh, Lerdahl and Jackendoff, which is on uh, some, it's actually on tonal music in the Western tradition and tries to show that it has uh, character, some characteristics that you also find in language, uh, which is pretty, it's interesting. And you know, there could even be a common origin. Uh, in fact, the same could be true about mathematics. You know, like how people have the ability to do mathematics is quite a mystery from an evolutionary <laughs> point of view. I mean, it certainly was no factor in selection. Like, you know, in hunter-gatherer societies, you didn't have more children if you could prove uh, theorems about prime numbers or something like that. Uh, it's, uh, 
So it, it played no role in human in the evolution of humans. In fact, up till now, you know, just the way, right now, in fact, many humans just don't even know they have the capacity because it's never been evoked by experience or whatever. So it's some kind of capacity that's there but played no role in human evolution. And that raises the question of what it's doing there. Uh, and one, you know, speculation that's been around is it's some kind of abstraction from the language faculty. Uh, that it, it takes some of the properties of the language faculty, throws out a lot of others, and then you get arithmetic, let's say, which is not so crazy. As I mentioned, this property of discrete infinity is realized very sharply in arithmetic, and it's true of natural language, and you could conceive of the idea that maybe it's just there because you throw away the rest of the language faculty and you keep this. Uh, and the same could be true of music. Maybe some of its structural properties and so on, the kind that Bernstein and Jack and Duff and Lerdell and others have studied are some kind of abstraction from the language faculty and maybe that's why it has some of the same properties. Or maybe they have some common origin or maybe they just develop totally separately and we don't know why. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's certainly something one can look at and people have looked at, but it's pretty much, it's pretty obscure, like most things. Uh, somebody asked a question on the paper, which I'll talk about. To please discuss the formation of case in various languages. Finnish, for example, has 15 cases, Greek nine, English three, uh, Chinese none, and so on. Uh, these are apparently all artifacts. So when we say English has three cases, it doesn't mean much. I mean, English has visible cases, you know, you hear them, uh, in pronouns, not in nouns. You know. uh, there's no difference between an accusative case and the nominative case of book. Um, it, it is for he and him, you know. But there's a little marginal residue of formal case systems in English. On the other hand, when you look, in Chinese, you don't hear it at all. However, work of the last 10 or 15 years, this kind of work I was talking about, which is trying to show that languages are really identical, uh, even though they look different, it's tended to show that the differences in visible case are just kind of marginal phenomena. <coughs> that in fact, all languages have the same case. Uh, and you can, the, the reason for believing that is that case isn't just something you hear, you know. It also has consequences. So there are, when you work out the principles of language, it turns out that nominative case has some very specific properties. And it turns out that English has those properties, and Chinese has those properties, and so on, even though they don't mark it in a sound. Which means, and it's very likely that every language has the case structure of at least Sanskrit, maybe Finnish. Uh, and that sometimes you hear it, and sometimes you don't hear it. And a lot of the apparent difference among language is just what happens to come out the mouth. You know. uh, but as far as the mind is concerned, it may be all the same. You know. They may all have the same case system or very similar case systems uh, with uh, various connections between what's going on in the head and the sensory motor apparatus. Those slight differences may make things sound very different. In fact, notice that when you study, suppose you're studying Latin, I mean, you don't spend time on things like, is the chicken ready to eat, you know, that kind of stuff, or the meaning of river or something. That's all internal, you know, same for you as the guys who spoke Latin. So you don't have to study that at all. Uh, what you have to study is all the cases, or that means the externalization of the cases. So you spend a lot of time memorizing paradigms. Yeah, because that's, a, that's arbitrary. It's some minor periphery of the language, which in fact is sort of a historical accident. Uh, which cases were pronounced and which ones weren't. And that's going to vary from language to language. So that's the kind of stuff you have to study. And it's a pain in the neck because you basically have to memorize it. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but the actual case systems could very well be identical. And it's, I mean, I don't think we know enough to say that with confidence, but certainly research is going in that direction. It's more and more finding that the phenomena that are associated with case and that follow from case and that case illustrates are found in languages where you don't hear it, like English and Chinese and so on. Incidentally, a lot of what you're taught in school when you're taught to speak this invention called proper English 
uh, is uh, inventions about case. So you're taught to say, uh, whom did he see, not who did he see. Uh, as far as we know, that never existed in the history of English. Uh, so like Shakespeare didn't use it. Uh, but by an analogy to Latin, uh, somewhere along the line, you know, teachers or language dictators or whatever, uh, decided that you ought to make English sound a little more like Latin. So kids keep getting this rammed into their head. Uh, and there's a lot of things like that. I mean, normal English, it, you know, if it had no artificial imposition, uh, would people would probably say things like, him and me were here, like all kids do. You know? And that, the reason is that that fits the rules of English. You're taught to say, he and I were here. And pe it's very hard, and people don't really assimilate it, so they end up saying things like between you and I and stuff like that, because what you're taught in school is use I every time you think you ought to use me, you know. So, uh, <laughs> which means you get all sorts of weird things coming out. Uh, but these things that you, you can assume that most of what you're taught in school about the language is probably wrong, uh, because it's, otherwise you wouldn't have to be taught it. When, when I say wrong, I don't mean it shouldn't be taught. Maybe it should be taught, because maybe you should get people to understand a kind of literary standard, and that's part of life. Uh, but it's not the way the language works, which is why you have to be taught it. You know? Like you're not taught things like about how to understand the chicken is ready to eat. You know? Nobody would even know how to teach that to you, in fact. Uh, uh, but uh, the things that you are taught are things like case, you know, what are the cases of Latin or where should you use them in English or stuff like that. Uh, on the other hand, I, to get back to the question, it's an, it, I think it's a, it's a reasonable speculation at this point that languages have the same case structure and that they differ in the externalization of it. Well, it's claimed that cultures have drastically different conceptual schemes, but uh, nobody knows what that means. I mean, from the point of view of a Martian looking at humans, they may all have the same conceptual scheme. I mean, f we're humans, so we're really interested in the differences among humans. You know, I mean, naturally, it makes sense. You know, it makes a lot of sense to be interested in the differences among humans. Uh, when we look at frogs, they all look the same. On the other hand, from the point of view of the frogs, that's probably not the way it is. Uh, from the point of view of the frogs, they're interested in the differences among frogs. I mean, they take for granted everything's a frog, you know, any reasonable thing's a frog. Uh, but the differences among frogs are what are important to their lives. So they may think that frogs come in all kind of wildly different varieties and so on, because that's what's of interest to them, not that something's acting like a frog. How else could you act? Uh, well, we take for granted that other creatures are acting like humans. I mean, that's just like instinctive. We don't think about it. Uh, that's common background, and we pay attention to the ways in which they don't act just like humans. And for ordinary life, that makes good sense. You know, that's why you marry one person and not another, you know, uh, or whatever it is. But uh, so that's a big part of human life, but it doesn't mean that it has any significance from the point of view of the study of the nature of humans. It might be a very peripheral element of the nature of humans, and it probably is. Uh, so just take the couple of examples that I gave, you know, river, book. Uh, I mean, there's not going to be any cultural diversity in those things, or about the chicken is ready to eat, or any of these cases. There's no cultural diversity because it comes out of our nature. Uh, the things that we call cultural diversity, we have every reason to be interested in because they're interesting to us as human beings. Uh, how much is, whether different, cultures have different conceptual schemes, we really don't have any reason to believe that. One more question. Yeah, okay. Wild children? Yeah, yeah. Well, those are again, these are the so-called wild children, you know, the wild boy of Aveyron was the famous example. Uh, what were called children were supposed to be raised by wolves or something like that. Uh, the past, stuff from the past, you really don't know how to evaluate very well. Uh, there were, you don't know what the history of the children was, okay? Uh, 
there are modern cases that have contemporary cases that have been studied carefully, like the one in Los Angeles, uh, Jeannie, who was a kid who was uh, had you know kind of psychotic parents, father at least, who locked her in a room at around age two, I think, uh, and she never got out and never spoke to her. He just grunted at her and you know, threw food at her, that sort of thing. She may have heard some noises coming from the window or somewhere or other, nobody knows. But basically she had no human experiences, you know, no linguistic experiences. She was found by, I think, a social worker or something when she was around, I think around 13 or so. And of course, immediately taken out, you know, put under care and so on. Uh, and one of the things that was done was uh, some of her caretakers were in fact uh, psychologists and linguists and they tried to take care of her, teach her as much as they could and bring her into the world as much as they could, but also to investigate what was going on. So what could she acquire and what couldn't she acquire and what did she already know without any experience and so on. And there's a lot of work on this. Unfortunately, it's not clear what it tells you because naturally Jeannie was completely psychotic. You know? I mean, nobody could go through an experience like that and be anything like a normal human being. So you don't know how much of what you're finding is just you know, massive damage. Again, like hitting a computer with a crowbar. Uh, and how much is really specific to these various faculties and the ways they develop. This is, again, one of those natural experiments. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's some, this interesting work, uh, Susan, uh, Curtis, Susan Curtis did the most serious work on this, she's a book and a lot of papers, uh, and it, you know, tells you what could be discovered, but uh, some <laughs> grossly speaking, it turned out that she was very, she was quite intelligent, she could do all sorts of things, and she was also apparently quite you know, appealing. She knew how to manipulate people and uh, uh, get them to do things and so on. Uh, and uh, at first they thought she was getting understanding language, but it turns out she was just using her intelligence and, you know, coquettish skills and various other things to make people think she was doing it. And when they investigated more seriously, she couldn't really do anything much with language. Uh, on the other hand, she had lots of other rich conceptual structure, you know, like she understood all sorts of, immediately, without any experience, right in the hospital, solving complicated conceptual problems and so on. Uh, but uh, you hardly know what this means, uh, because any defect that was found, you don't know whether to attribute it to uh, late development of language, delayed development of language, or to general psychosis. Unfortunately, uh, it ends up as a very sad story. She ended up being kind of a vegetable you know, through various maltreatment and so on. And there are a few other cases like that. There are some cases which aren't that, you know, which are less horrifying, uh, which are very instructive. So a couple of years ago, uh, some uh, psychologists in Philadelphia, students of Lila Gleitman, who's very one of the leading cognitive psychologists, uh, they discovered uh, children. Uh, uh, up until fairly recently, it was assumed that deaf children didn't have any language. It's now known that that's totally false, that the language of the deaf is very much like ordinary language, just the different modality it has a lot of the same properties and develops the same way. And so it's just another language, like Swahili, uh, uses a different modality. Uh, they discovered a couple of kids, cousins, <coughs> Uh, who had been brought up in what's called an oralist tradition, fortunately mostly dead, but it was the orthodoxy for a long time. The orthodoxy was that if kids are hearing disabled, you shouldn't allow them to learn sign language. You should force them to lip read. Uh, it's a little bit like saying you should force kids to learn English, whatever the language is. Uh, the, uh, and that was very damaging. Uh, it prevented normal <coughs> mental and intellectual and linguistic development. That's all gone, for it, mostly gone by now, fortunately. Anyhow, these kids were brought up in this oralist tradition. Their parents had been heavily indoctrinated not to teach them sign. Her parents were speaking non, you know, had uh, spoken language. Uh, in fact, the parents were uh, t told by the, you know, therapists and so on, not to even gesture to the kids. So, you know, walk around like this. 
so that they don't get any gestures. Uh, so they're forced to do lip reading. Uh, and this had gone on for a couple of years. The kids were like three or four when they found them. But they played together, you know. And it turns out that they had invented their own language uh, with zero evidence, you know. This is a case, this is a perfect, almost perfect experiment. They had had no input. They had just created their own language, a sign language. And it turned out to be at approximately, approximately the character of normal language development. You know, you take kids of the same age in a normal environment, that's about, they'd be doing about the same thing. Uh, you know, same structure, same complexity, and so on and so forth. Well, okay, the experiment, of course, was ended as soon as they found the kids. Then they just taught them American Sign Language. But uh, uh, there are a couple of cases like that. Uh, there's one really interesting case, which is being investigated right now, actually, in part by a former student of ours at MIT. Uh, they found in Nicaragua uh, a community of non, of people who are seriously hearing disabled, who had just over time had created their own language. And it's now just the language that kids learn as they grow up, and it's the language that's used, and so on. Uh, but again, with no input, uh, so just developed. You know. And that's a, kind of a natural case. Uh, there are other things like that, so-called creoles, or some of the same properties, languages that are created you know, by for example, in slave communities where you bring people together from many different linguistic groups and they're sort of stuck together. Uh, they t tend rather quickly, in fact, to create a common language called Creole. Uh, and these are just like ordinary languages as far as anybody knows. Uh, and the way in which they're constructed, you know, does tell you something about uh, the essential nature of language, just as these, uh, uh, these other cases do, including the so-called, you know, wild children, but uh, those are, you know, re I mean, hard, uh, they're restricted in what you can learn from them because of the complexity of the conditions of, in which they've developed. 